All right, are there people waiting already? Yes, and I'm gonna kick us off. So welcome everyone to the CIN webinar, Using Virtual Reality to Improve uh, Patient Care. So during this conversation, you'll learn a little bit about the journey that San Mateo Medical Center took to effectively implement virtual reality into their care, particularly for their chronic pain and acute pain patients. So my name is Marie Hubbard and I'm the program manager for the California Improvement Network, also known as CIN. CIN is a learning and action network that's fueled by the energy and innovations of its partners and members. A really fun fact about CIN is that it's actually the only quality improvement network in California that brings together both commercial and safety net provider organizations, health plans, and other quality improvement support organizations. It offers them an opportunity to discuss uh, learn and give advice to one another. CIN is a project of the California Healthcare Foundation and is managed by Health Force Center at UCSF. Uh, you're welcome to follow the links on the screen to learn a little bit more about both of our organizations. I just want to share a few tech tips before we get started. Um, all of you are on mute and will remain on mute for the next hour. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A and chat function located at the bottom of the screen. We want to make this as interactive and engaging as possible, so we welcome any and all questions and we'll be stopping the content throughout to answer those um, as we can. If you have any technical issues and you need help, please feel free to direct message me using the chat function and I can help troubleshoot with you. This webinar will be recorded and we'll be sharing the recording afterwards in the coming weeks, both with those of you who are with us today as well as those who have registered. So now I have uh, the great honor of introducing our two speakers uh, for today. So Dr. Mike Aritao, he's the Chief Medical Information Officer and Emergency Room Physician at San Mateo Medical Center. And he was the first champion to introduce virtual reality uh, at San Mateo Medical Center. And Dr. Melissa flutter Johan, who's the Director of pain, the Pain Management Clinic and a Clinical Psychologist at San Mateo Medical Center. And she uh, was very luckily recruited by Dr. Mike Aritao to be the champion uh, for introducing virtual reality into the pain management clinic. So I will now stop sharing my screen and I will pass it off um, to Dr. Aritao to get us uh, started with the content. Oh. And you're, you're still on mute. Oh, sorry. There we go. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Can share my, everyone see my screen now? Yeah, will you just switch your the settings around again? Okay. There we go. That's working now? It's working. We're good to go. No, it, it flipped from what we did. I have to move my camera. Okay. You see me okay? Okay. Great. Um, I don't have, okay, control. Good. Okay, so did you want to throw, throw the poll up first, Marie? You bet. So, so while uh, Marie's getting the poll up, here we go. Um, just wanted to sort of get a gauge for uh, the audience here. Um, has your organization ever uh, started using virtual reality with patients? Uh, and while we're doing that, I just wanted to say um, thanks for joining. Um, um, I've been in, involved or interested in VR for a long time. In fact, uh, VR is very similar in terms of the type of uh, contour of its um, interest and uh, adoption to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence was discovered a long time ago, and there was an AI winter. Um, VR had the same thing. Um, it really started off early in, in the 60s or late 60s. Uh, had a, a resurgent, well actually in the initial uh, peak was uh, in their early or mid 90s and then it sort of died off uh, and we'll sort of go over that. Um, and, but I really think now that uh, VR has come of age and it's going to be critical for um, um, medicine, I think it's gonna be a modality that's gonna be used in, across all specialties. So I'm really um, 
enthused about it and I'm happy that it's finally here and more practical for us now. So um, for that, the agenda really quickly is I'm gonna do a, a little primer on some of the background of VR and then talk about setting up a program and some of the, the experiences we've had. And during the primer, I'm also gonna give some tips and everything, some practical um, tips and tricks uh, and some uh, lessons learned also during, during the primer. And then after that, we'll go to Melissa and she'll talk about her detailed use case using VR in the pain management clinic. So it looks like most people don't uh, have VR in, although some people did, so that's good. So um, I don't know how many uh, people here uh, attended Dr. Bullock's session um, a couple weeks ago or last week, but um, she did go over some basics. Uh, I'm gonna go over uh, a little more of the basics because I think it's important that when you're using this technology, especially earlier on, uh, that you sort of know some of the technical basics of it uh, so you can make some informed decisions when you're talking to different vendors. So one of the first things is the basic thing about trying to immerse someone into a world they're not really in is the tracking, which is a key component. And there's, there's tracking of your, through your position in space, so moving back and forth like this, and there's tracking of just your head on a swivel. And that's uh, the head on the swivel is B, and the, the position is A. And when you have just or, uh, the, or the head on the swivel, which is the more common, well, the more simple version of VR, that's called three degrees of freedom or three DOF, D-O-F. When you have both, it's um, called six degrees of freedom because of the six axes. Um, what's important for this is if you're thinking about an application, for example, if you're working uh, in the ER like me and you want to use it, you don't want them to have six degrees of freedom because then they would want to move their whole body around. And then if you're trying to do a procedure and you're using it for distraction, that can be a problem. So you would only want three DOF. So that's why head tracking is important. Field of view, uh, that's um, essentially how much uh, you can see when you put on these, these goggles, uh, head mounted display, how much of your field of view is taken up by the, the virtual environment. What's important about this is it has to do with um, immersion and, I, and Dr. Bullock went over this and immersion or presence. Um, that's the, the power of virtual reality and depending on what you want to do, for example, distracting someone, usually a wider field of view gives you more immersion, but it also can uh, be, you give you subject to more uh, incidents of cyber sickness. So but anyway, this is something you just need to know that people talk about all the time. And um, Here's um, a, a, a diagram which sort of overlays some of the common uh, head-mounted displays that are out there now, starting at the bottom here with 90 degrees um, and then going all the way up to 170. Uh, obviously, as you get wider field of view, the, the, the head-mounted displays get more expensive. Um, and you can see that we're starting to get towards the limits of human vision. <clears throat> um, what's important about that is, um, just so you remember that the, the um, you know, it, as you get wider, it, it gets more expensive and then, but you have to worry more about cyber sickness. Um, sorry, so um, another uh, concept you should be familiar with is interpupillary distance. Um, this is the, the amount of distance between your pupils. Um, this is something that usually can be adjusted within uh, you know, good head mounted displays, and it should be an adjustment that, that is available. Sometimes it's software adjusted, but sometimes there's actually a, a little a dial or knob in that you move to actually adjust it um, manually. Um, this is important because, if, especially if people need to read text um, and just need to be in, in the session for longer periods, if you don't have the right IPD, um, this can cause fatigue. There's also the issue of um, that right now head mounted displays have a sweet spot. And uh, if you don't have the correct, correct IPD, you won't get into that sweet spot. And so the image just in general won't look very good. So that's, that's important. Um, really quickly, just to make sure everyone understands that, you know, we have uh, the central vision from the fovea um, and then we have, um, we, but that's not our, and then the FOV vision, which is the high, sort of the high resolution vision, and you'll see why this is important in, in a minute. Um, that's only about uh, 45 degrees. 
um, although our rain, our full horizontal field of view is 200. And then when we talk about field of view also, um, um, the, um, the uh, field of view, one other thing is they sometimes talk about horizontal field of view, which is 200 degrees, and then there's vertical field of view. The horizontal field of view obviously is a little more important. Um, but and usually the uh, when they when they talk about field of views in, in um, head mount displays sometimes you have to be careful because they talk about a diagonal field of view which is what they do in TVs too so you just have to be careful also when they're saying well this is a great field of view but it may not be because they're using the diagonal version um, resolution is always important also um, this as you can see uh, in the upper left corner here uh, is the one of the early head mounted displays and as you go on further uh, it gets to larger resolutions resolutions uh, in general when they're higher they're better but um, something that you have to take into account and is pixel density which is very important and that actually is the amount that uh, that you can distinguish in the real resolution in, in your um, fovea uh, con uh, compared with the display the fovea is about 60 pixels per degree. The original one here, which was a commercial, was um, I have it seven pixels per degree. But and you would think that this one, which is this large resolution, is like six times that resolution. The pixels per degree, actually, the pixel density is only 10, and so it has to do with some optics, and that's actually important when you're wanting to make sure that if people are going to be reading text or doing looking fine details that the pixel density, um, you know, you know, you're not paying a lot of money or for a, a larger resolution display that really doesn't have that much of a higher pixel density because then it's not really necessary. Um, refresh rate versus frame rate versus latency. The thing that is important about this is frame rate is usually, which is on the bottom here, is how many frames per second that the computer is generating. That's important because you want to make sure that it has enough to prevent lag and from people getting sick. Um, um, and that's sort of computer limited. The refresh rate is more that has to do with um, the displays and the head mounted display. And as you can see, if, if you're looking at things which are moving fast and that, that's part of your application, you would want to have a higher refresh rate. Usually 60 hertz is, uh, which is 60 times per second is, is the a minimum amount. Um, you'll see ones on on the on the market mostly are in, at 90 hertz right now. Uh, and as you get to higher re refresh rates, people just get a more um, sense of, of smoothness. And especially if you have a lot of things moving around, that that's more important. And then the other thing here is this is latency. This is important for cyber sickness, and this is just sort of taking the the cycle from when a, a photon is starts gets you know, hits your eye and how long that takes to go through all the processes, all the motion detection, the processing, the display, et cetera, to generate the virtual world. And anything more than 20 milliseconds is gonna cause significant latency and lag. And that's not something you wanna have uh, when you're doing any type of therapeutic, um, you know, session. Um, another important thing is tracking. Um, Initially, things were what we called outside in, and as you can see, there they have uh, you have external cameras, or in some cases, like infrared lasers that are tracking your position and tracking the head mounted display position. Actually, it's tracking that because it has special markers on it, and if you have controllers, it'll track those too. But at, now that technology is advanced, um, it's going getting to be inside out tracking on the right, which is really important when you're thinking about space. Uh, limitations uh, and that's something that we, we had problems with here if you have a dedicated room then the outside in tracking is usually uh, better um, and especially if they want to move around it's going to be a mover moving around type of application called room scale uh, but inside out tracking is much better if you have to move move the the equipment around if you're going to or if you're in a small place or you, you don't have a dedicated space for it the only thing about inside out tracking right now is it's not exactly as um, fine uh, a, you know, resolution as the outside in tracking. 
I mean, the outside in tracking could be almost sub millimeter resolution. If you're interested in like, for example, physical therapy things where you want to do measurements that have to be pretty precise, you may want to do the outside in versus the inside out. Um, this is a really important thing, remote viewing. Um, on the left, you have to see something here. It's, there's an application and in the upper left corner, you actually see what the, the patient is seeing. This is really important in all sorts of situations. Uh, I mean, we saw it in the ER uh, when I, we were put on a head mount display and trying to figure out, you know, are they seeing, are you see, we would always have to ask them, are you seeing this screen? Are you seeing that screen to get them started? And then you wanna also, if there's a sort of a progression for this session, you would wanna know exactly where the patient is in that session without having to ask them and ruin their, ruining, sort of breaking their immersion. So that's, that's really the, an important functionality to have. It's called broadcasting. Another way to do it is just display mirroring. As you can see, this person's got a head mount display on it and they're just, you're actually seeing the, uh, what they're seeing on a, a separate monitor. Um, either way is good, although broadcasting is much easier and better, and it's, you know, especially if you, put, you can do it on a, uh, sort of like a tablet. So I'm gonna go real quickly through um, the um, evolution of head-mounted displays. Like I said before, VR has been around for a long time. The first head-mounted display was in 1968 in the University of North Carolina. You can see here they were using miniature cathode ray tubes, which were what TVs used to be made of, um, on the eyes. And then they, this was the sword of Damocles, which was sticking into their, their helmet just to do, do the tracking. Um, we've come a long way. And 1995 was the first commercial uh, head mounted display. It only had two degrees of freedom. The field of view was limited. So was the refresh rate and also the resolution was very small. But as you can see, every six, seven years uh, or less now every three years, um, we're getting more de degrees of freedom. The tracking is more um, sophisticated. The refresh rate is higher. And of, of course the resolution is higher. And, and this one here, the Oculus Quest um, is now, probably one of the best-selling uh, individual head-mounted displays. It's, it's essentially what's called a standalone. It's got everything built into it. You don't need cameras on the outside. Um, it, you don't need to hook it up to a computer so it's untethered. Uh, and it's uh, sold over a million headsets. Um, th these, will, you could just, uh, for the slides when they're available, you could see um, these are just comparison of consumer displays and, and then of, of more expensive um, enterprise displays. And you can see how the prices can go up pretty quickly when you start to get higher resolutions and fields of view. Uh, uh, one quickly thing to say about software, uh, most of this software uh, you see in virtual reality and these products that are coming out is built on a couple different tools. And one that's the majority leader is Unity. Um, this is and it's something you wanted to start on your own. You could actually download Unity for free. As long as you don't use it commercially, you can uh, publish it and, and let other people use it. Unreal Engine is uh, not as popular uh, because there's more programming involved. And then what I think is really important is that um, virtual reality is coming to the browser. And because of a, 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 a standard called WebXR, which is completely based on the web stack. You can actually do virtual reality in, in the web browser. The web browser knows what head mounted display you're using when you plug it in or, uh, or even if it's uh, tetherless. And um, you can, the web, the web browser then can just become the, the platform, which I think is important and will be probably the future platform for health, healthcare is everyone's got a web browser and it's easy to disseminate. Um, A-frame is a specific scripting language that you can pick up pretty quickly um, where you can actually make your own um, uh, WebXR type or you know browser-based uh, virtual reality. So really quickly in the future, um, fovea, remember we talked about how the fovea has the most uh, you know highest resolution uh, in, in vision. This, uh, they're, we're working, they're working on the a way to just uh, focus what the fovea, the part that the fovea is looking at to make it the highest rendering area because the, the peripheral part, you don't look at directly and that could be much more blurry. And that will actually allow lower power computers to power much more immersive uh, environments. Um, and to, to do fovea rendering, you actually need eye tracking. And there, it was first 
embedded in around 2014. And now in some of the more enterprise versions, it actually is, is being built in. And I think we were gonna see this pretty much in general the next couple of years. Um, there's also something called uh, very focal lenses. Um, this is important because um, when you see something close, your eyes go th turn in and, they, and they, when they're, it's farther away, your eyes come out. But when in virtual reality, it's only one screen. And so you lose that, that uh, connection and that can cause problems, especially like if you've had a session and then they wanna drive afterwards, uh, if they've done a, a lot of close work, they may have to have a, a period or for 20 minutes or so uh, before they can sort of get this, um, this connection back. And so that's why it's important uh, that, we, that they're building these very focal lenses, which uh, takes this into account. Um, the other thing is this has to do with, uh, I'm sure maybe HDR, a high dynamic um, range rendering. And that's, that's something that you see in TVs now. Um, and that's uh, right now the displays and the head mount is, are, are, are somewhat low. And this, they're working on something to make this much more bright uh, and more closer to natural, natural conditions so you get more immersion. And then of course, everyone feels silly wearing a head mounted display. So they're, um, it's, 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 uh, they're working on making it like a form factor of, of glasses. And um, finally, um, more sensors are gonna be started embedded into these different head mounted displays. And, and this is an example of one that has both eye tracking and an EEG because they, then uh, for certain therapeutic things, I mean, this is essentially biofeedback on steroids, right? So you can actually use the EEG um, signal to feed back into uh, your, uh, your, your uh, virtual environment. And Melissa will be talking about, the, uh, she actually uses an application like that, but unfortunately it's a separate device. But you know, as they get more advanced, that will be all built in and that will be important for you know, biofeedback type of uh, applications in health. Um, hygiene obviously is a real important, even more important now. Um, we, um, there's a, a couple of different things uh, that you can do for head mounted displays. They, uh, there's aftermarket or third party um, sort of uh, gaskets that you can put on for the facial interface. And you can see those on the left and they're usually made of medical grade silicon. That's really important so you can clean them. But the part that's always hard to clean that we found and that was something else or lessons learned is, you know, you can't really clean the, the straps and the, the, the top part of the head mounted display because that can either be, um, it's not always made out of uh, plastic. It can actually be fabric and Velcro. And so what we did was we used, uh, as you see on the right, a surgical buffon and that therefore that provides a barrier and that's, that's something uh, that's something that we learned and that should be used to protect hygiene with multiple users. The other thing is in the middle there, you can't, there are disposable gaskets, but we've also, we were using those, but I think that, you know, sometimes they get lost, you have to replenish them. And the, the easiest way is to, and is to use these medical grade silicon gaskets because that also is similar to how we clean other things. Um, these are just things you can uh, refer to. And, um, on the top, we have a, a bunch of blogs and, and information sites that give current uh, updates on all the latest VR uh, goings on, both in entertainment and in, in, you know, in enterprise and, and serious uh, applications. In the middle here, you see uh, the top four journals there that are sort of publishing in virtual reality. The one that's Presence, this was the original uh, virtual reality journal and that has all some, a lot of the original research and from MIT Press and that stopped a couple of years ago. And then the bottom here, there's two major conferences that if you're interested, you should be looking at. One is um, put on by VR Voice, uh, Virtual Reality and Healthcare Symposi Global Symposium. The other one is Virtual Medicine by Cedar sinai And right now they're, they're both virtual, although Cedar sinai usually obviously is in LA and the, um, the VR voice one has moved around from Nashville and Phoenix, et cetera. So um, I'm gonna talk now about setting up a VR program. I'm, am I even behind a little bit? Um, can you uh, put up, there's a, I think we wanted to do uh, a, a poll. So th this is, is a, how's your organization implemented VR into the workflows for um, 
have have the for the ones that did so there's 25 percent and that looks like it's about similar um okay so uh, a lot of what uh, we do here um uh, how i did it here uh, was very similar and, and somewhat generic to how you start a new innovation um the important thing is to find a champion obviously and a stakeholder and, and melissa was a a phenomenal one. In fact, I didn't really have to sell Melissa because she already knew about uh, virtual reality at a conference and she was interested in it. Obviously, they need to be in a leadership position so they can make decisions. When you have an innovation thing, innovative thing like this, it's, it's it, you know, you need someone who can make that decision. Um, it's a plus if they have their own HMD because they and then have some technical background because then they can be more familiar with, with the product um, and even also a gaming background. Um, and then obviously well respected in the institution and a recognized innovator. And so I think those are sort of the important qualifications and, and Melissa, um, you know, she was well respected an innovator, leadership position, stakeholder. Um, she didn't have her own HMD, but she, you know, she had, again, had heard about it in a conference. And so she was really interested in that. Those are, I think, really key to uh, getting the right champion. Um, choosing a solution. Um, this shows the whole uh, industry landscape. There's a lot of different vendors out there. The ones that are outlined in red are the ones that are in health, but this is a year ago, so there are more now. Um, you really need to, um, you know, demo multiple vendors to see what you want. Don't just pick the first one you see. Um, you know, there's different types of tracking technology like I talked about. There are different controllers that even talk about those. And do you even need a controllers? You know which type of head-mounted display are they using? Is it you know immersive enough? You've got to try these things out. And of course, there's always the price, uh, and then you need to ask about security. A lot of the, these these startups uh, are coming uh, from with technologists who are founders who have no healthcare experience, and so you you know you got to make sure that they've covered all of the bases with security. I already talked about physical space. Um, yeah, it, you know, it depends on what type of tracking, but, you know, if you're limited to space, you can do it seated and the inside out tracking is good for that and also untethered too. Um, what we did for workflow, which was really good was, um, I thought was that I wanted to make it uh, in the emergency department. I wanted to make it so that uh, it was sort of similar to something that was done before. So I took the, an example of the Tona pen which is used for measuring intraocular pressure. It was kept in a room separate in the med room. Uh, and that was where we were gonna keep the head mounted display. And so it was a nursing order. So I made it the same uh, for a virtual reality, a nursing order also. And so you could see here in our pulse check ED, and this is, by the way, this is test, so it's not any PHI, this is not a real patient. Um, you can see that there's where the, the top one is where we ordered the Tona pen and, and sort of in alphabetical order, and then you have virtual reality glasses um, also in the nursing section. And then the nurses know that when you order that, they just like the Tona pen, they go into the, the med room and they get that to bring out to the patient. So that, that's, uh, I would recommend to do something like that to, to make it very similar in workflow. So it makes it easy and more frictionless for the provider to order um, the, the virtual reality. The other thing is um, the headset, uh, to have the the instructional material, you know, with uh, a lot of pictures and not the vendors won't necessarily have something like this. Although as they get more sophisticated, they will, but we made our own, as you can see, uh, this was for um, a more complex um, head mounted display, which is actually a combination of a, a cell phone um, and a, a, a casing. And we really had to show them how to do it. And of course, also creating standard work is important. So uh, people just, it becomes automatic. Um, for reimbursement, right now, obviously, there's no CPT codes for virtual reality specifically, um, but we, we created a dummy service code, as you can see here in our archaic and envision system, um, so that we could keep track at least of use, so you can do reports on that, and that's important for your metrics. Um, there are some CPT codes that have been used um, for generic CPT codes, which people have applied successfully for physical therapy. So if you're looking at you know, using VR and you wanna try and get some reimbursement, that's one way. And the other one is for uh, identifying oculomolar and vestibular ocular function impairments. 
um, and there are some CPT codes that are being used for startups there. I, there may be others, but these are the ones that I know about. Um, finally, with the metrics, um, these are pretty uh, sort of generic. Um, obviously, you want to look at patient satisfaction if you can, provider satisfaction, your primary goal, and you know, in Melissa's case, she'll show you some pain scale, anxiety scale, if it's physical therapy, range of motion, strength. Um, and, and so it really just depends. Um, obviously, you want the care team satisfaction too, because we started off having the providers um, put on the headsets, but actually the nurses got much more enthusiastic about it in the ER, and they were the ones who started uh, actually applying it, even though the initial standard work was the, for the providers to apply it. Cyber sickness is more unique to um, VR, and that's something that you should keep track of to make sure that you know you're having the appropriate uh, sort of uh, setup and configuration. Changes in cycle time to make sure that it's not causing more more time, um, and then obviously cost savings. So that's my presentation. Finished about on time, and um, if there's any questions, uh, you can type them to Marie and otherwise I'll, I'll let Melissa take over and I'll stop sharing. All right, thank you. And I don't have a gaming background or a strong technology background, <laughs> but fortunately you do, so we can, uh, right. can go to you if need be. Um, okay. Hi, all right, so um, again, I'm Melissa. I am a leader of the pain clinic at San Mateo Medical Center and a licensed clinical psychologist. So we um, are part of adding virtual reality to our clinic. So um, today I hope to talk a little bit about uh, our clinic and how we use VR, but, but also we have to, it's hard to talk about chronic pain if we don't mention quickly about the current state of chronic pain and evidence-based treatments that we're using in our clinic. So we hope to get through that today. And then also I do have some vignettes, some personal cases from patients to share. Okay, so these are, these are the tough statistics here. So, um, so we, what we know and what we've heard in, in multiple reports is that uh, chronic pain is a national health care crisis. Um, uh, you know, reports show that 100 million people are diagnosed with chronic pain. It's a huge burden to our health care system. I think, you know, $635 billion are spent on health care, and it's a huge loss. Um, our opioid crisis, it's taking more lives annually than motor vehicle accidents, gun violence, or breast cancer. And actually a newer statistic shows that the opioid crisis is considered now the deadliest drug. Um, 200 Americans are dying each day. And I know we don't have uh, the latest latest in terms of the healthcare crisis now, but we have heard that there are some even more problems with use disorders and using opioids um, since the COVID-19 pandemic. All right, so in, in the world of chronic pain management, what do we do? Um, typically, most clinics, most treatments are kind of focused on the biomedical model only. Um, notably, if you look into research, it shows the biopsychosocial model is the treatment for chronic pain. So most clinics are missing kind of two thirds of the treatment for chronic pain. So what does that typically include? It's, it's medications. Um, this could be opioid or non-opioid medications. Therapies of some sort, PT, OT is, is offered. Injections, um, possibly operations. People tend to kind of go at things two, three times, rotate meds, so on, and then give up. Patients are left uh, to kind of say, go home, manage your pain. So at a pain clinic, or at our, our clinic, pain management clinic at San Mateo Medical Center, we are really excited about our functional restoration program. We kind of offer this mind-body program. And as far as I know, it is the only integrated pain management program offered by a safety net healthcare system in Northern California. And then even more so, we're, we're thrilled to offer VR now to our patients. 
So who are our patients, who are we? Um, San Mateo Medical Center, we, uh, our patients are part of our healthcare system. They are referred by primary care. They are our underserved population. And many have uh, you know, adverse childhood experiences that includes tr significant trauma histories. They are lower in socioeconomic status. Um, homeless, we have had several patients who are homeless enroll in our clinic and significant substance use histories. Um, so we do see patients, they have kind of a whole host of both medical and mental health conditions and chronic pain kind of just being one of a, a list of, of conditions that we're managing. Um, when, when patients join our clinic, they enroll in our kind of mind-body program and I'll, and I'll chat a little more about that. Um, they also are part of, if appropriate, weaning opioids. Um, so we do inherit some patients who are on high dose opioids and our, our team kind of uh, helps them wean off opioids or get them on safer opioids if need be. Um, and the goal is for them to learn non-pharmacological modalities for managing their pain. Um, and then VR is added, uh, kind of signed up as an adjunct therapy in our clinic. So here's an example of our classes. We have pain education class, a twice a week mindfulness meditation class, twice a week, group PT, uh, twice a week, our yoga, tai chi, a couple times a week as well, virtual reality, acupuncture, the medical hypnosis, individual pain psych, psychiatry as well, um, and alumni group is offered. So we offer these classes both in English and in Spanish. And um, right now during the, the pandemic, because everything's done in groups it's, and it's not really safe to get in together in groups, we have all these classes going online. So people are signing up via Zoom, Zoom classes. So here's an example of a postdoc we're tortured. Um, we put him to the test of trying out our VR. Um, and, and this is kind of the year that we got it going in our clinic. I think there's some of my sloppy handwriting in the back. Um, but this is, this is an example of what it would look like in our clinic if a patient were to use our VR. So how does it work? <clears throat> I, I know that Mike mentioned a little bit about the technology and how things work in the world of VR. When it comes to, to managing chronic pain, um, really with, with what's, what's very different about chronic pain in terms of, in compared to, I think, acute pain is that central nervous system is highly involved. So when, when, you, when you have chronic pain, your brain, your neuronal networks kind of rewire itself and, and then, you know, people end up in these kind of pain patterns where their, their brains are sending, sending signals to their body to hurt. Um, so very much we're looking at central nervous system conditions. So what we hope with virtual reality is that people kind of get <clears throat> broken up in that process, that they change their perception of their reality and they change their pain sensations while they're in this, this different world. And we hope that to see those neuronal networks over time, hoping to kind of rewire that and have a different experience with pain. Um, so we know that, uh, you know, functional MRI studies, other studies show that the, when people are in VR, uh, when they are doing VR, there's pain related activity reduces. Um, so that we having a, a different experience is kind of what we're excited about in the chronic pain world. So we chose um, firsthand technology. And one of the main reasons was, I, I think this was a couple years ago, I think we have the 2016 version that Mike was showing in his slide. Um, I think that's right around that time, 2015, 16. I can't remember exactly when we got it in, but but this particular company offered this biofeedback component, which we were super excited about. And as you know, biofeedback is considered one of the kind of um, treatments, can be evidence-based treatments as part of the, uh, you know, along with other components, treatments, modalities in a pain clinic, um, people use biofeedback. So to get this in, our, in the VR uh, was, was exciting for our team. 
So the glow is, um, and, and I'll show pictures, I think. Yeah, I'll have a couple pictures in a minute. The glow people are <clears throat> in this kind of um, volcanic world, um, tropical island-like world where they get to see their heart rate in on the volcano. And as they're able to kind of calm down and lower their heart rate through breath and work, they get to collect fireflies, immerse, and then feed lanterns. And then most of our patients are really into the cool. Um, they, in this one, um, we're in this kind of snow-like environment where you're gliding down the stream and you, you get to feed otters with fish and bubbles and people like that. Um, so here's an example of glow. These, these pictures don't, don't really do it justice. It's, it's much more vivid and, and cool in real life. So does this work? Um, I think that's what we all want to know. Um, we do know that, like, as Mike said, I think, uh, you know, things kind of peaked in the VR world during the 90s. During, we, we also saw it used on Star Trek. Freddie Mercury came back to life. Um, we've seen it in, used in like medical settings and skills training. Uh, we know about a study done, one of the first studies done on um, burn survivors where they were using VR during painful burn, changing painful uh, burn wounds. And patients who are in a VR during these procedures relied less on opioids. So that, that was an exciting study. Again, acute pain. Um, there's not a lot of data that we know uh, in terms of uh, chronic pain and virtual reality. There is a fibromyalgia study that showed good results when used with other non-opioid modalities. Um, notably, fibromyalgia is kind of considered one of the bread and butter kind of centralized pain conditions that, and, and what we do see a lot at the county level is centralized pain conditions. So um, we've also, I've also seen a study in Tennessee done where he was using virtual reality as part of his pain program and showed some good results in pain reduction. And then Stanford and other medical centers also have shown immediate results. But we don't know a lot in terms of long-term effects. So we ran our own quick little study. I'm just looking at the time here. Um, we had 20 patients do virtual reality multiple times. I think the average is about nine. We asked everybody to take, uh, what's your pain going in? What's your pain coming out of VR? We asked about nausea and dizziness, uh, just as could be a potential side effect. And would they do VR again? And then we've also asked if they've had previous experience. And then we, we were also collecting kind of quarterly day, mood and functioning scales and, and tracking reduction of opioids. In the so I think um, in terms of, Nausea and dizziness, no one in our, in our, who did VR, who answered the question, no one endorsed problems like that. I think one person had an experience with VR in a mall, and that was it. Um, but for the most part, you know, virtual reality at, at our, you know, at, at the county level, people are not, it does not have a lot of opportunities to, to do the virtual reality. And many of our patients don't have a lot of, um, advanced technology and gaming opportunities and things like that. So it was very exciting for them. So we had 75% um, of our patients reported a pain reduction um, right immediately after VR. This is pretty huge because, you know, opioids itself, I think the studies show about 20 to 30, depending on where, which, which paper we're looking at, but um, only opioids provide about 20 to 30 percent reduction of pain, and that's generally within a six-month time period. After taking opioids for six months, um, that those effects kind of wear off anyway. So as we see, um, you know, virtual reality is much more powerful as an analgesic um, than opioids or can be. Um, so that's exciting. Um, we also. Um, we had a few few of our patients needed reinsurance that they were not being recorded. They're, you know, as as you saw in, in Mike's presentation, they're in these 
head devices and it, you know, with the computer. So, so they, they wanted to make sure that this was not being recorded. Um, a couple of patients did not like the tunnel. Um, there's one part where you're on this, um, you're on the stream and you go through a tunnel. Um, but overall, everyone I think said they would do it again and try it again. And it was a pretty positive experience. We also found significant improvement in mood, anxiety scores, depression, somatic uh, symptoms reduction, reduced, um, functional dis disability scores diminished, catastrophic thinking, um, subjective pain ratings improved, and we also saw long-term impact on opioids. So we are excited. We hope virtual reality could have a, a longer impact on pain and mood as a whole. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about a couple of case studies here in our clinic. So patient one came to VR with migraine symptoms. She did cool. She was able to use VR as well as other skills learned in the program to lessen pain intensity. Um, so she went from a pain eight to a six. And other skills included diaphragmatic breathing and focus on breath while in cool. So she stated, this is some cool, I think the exact word was shit. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, you know, I, I bring this up because if you have therapists as part of your team, you can really use VR along with other skills that you're teaching them like diaphragmatic breathing, biofeedback, you know, all these things that uh, those of us that, who are psychologists and mental health professionals we're using with our patients. And we can really use VR as part of that too. And, and I think uh, Mike was talking about billing for therapists, we can bill for therapy sessions. Um, so patient two is a Palestinian immigrant from Gaza Strip, came to therapy session the day that the US-Israel embassy opened in Jerusalem with multiple Palestinian protests and deaths, was a, able to engage in GLOW, so that has the biofeedback component. And after 20 minutes, was able to get his heart rate down and collect fireflies to feed the lantern. So he started in the 90s and got down to the 70s. Um, this, is, this is significant for him. We've been working on, on having his heart rate, uh, you know, in other diaphragmatic breathing and biofeedback strategies have not been very successful with him. Um, and so this was, this was a, a, a good day for us to be able to provide him some pain relief and some relief, um, even if it's just for the brief time. So patient three did cool. Later said, said that the effect stayed with her for three days and she continued to feel like she was floating. Patient four is currently homeless, living in a shelter where she must leave for two full days a week and carry all her possessions in a rolling bag. She's unable to engage in VR and finds cool to be a fun escape. After engaging in cool for 40 minutes, she reported pain reduction from 10 to six. So I really highlighted these patients just to see kind of the, the, the type of population we're, we're dealing with, um, with homelessness, um, people who've had a significant trauma, uh, you know, difficult with immigration to the United States and so on. Um, so giving, we're, it's really especially um, important to me that we're able to offer this to them. Okay, so just finally some mention about, uh, you know, during the pandemic, uh, obviously safety hygiene is very important. You know, the, this is something I think can be offered pretty safely. Patients can get set up in, in their own space so they don't have to share you know, be next to one another, um, equipment and everything can be sterilized in between. Um, also, I know that the newer models are offering virtual reality, so you can just take it home. It's all, in, like, like Mike had mentioned, in the later models, you, you can have it, you don't have to set it all up in the room, but they can just go home. And so we can have them rent the equipment, take it home with them. So a few lessons learned from my end, um, at, you know, space is, is one of the challenges in the county hospital. Um, so having a space, especially during COVID times where people can 
set up and be by themselves to do it. Um, the tech support was was important. As I mentioned, I'm I, I don't have a, a pretty significant tech uh, you know background. Um, I'm I'm in the more soft science of things. Um, so you know I being able to kind of consider being able to to reach out to whatever company you go with and and see if you can have somebody available to help troubleshoot if there were issues that that happened. Um, which did happen a few times, but not often. Um, and, and then also it's important to kind of test companies out first. Um, our team did that. It, you know, we, it, it's, it's easy to go with the first one because they're all, they're all exciting and new. Um, but my, my only advice would be to try them all out before choosing what's right for your clinics. All right, I'm even early. I rushed through. Um, so I think that's it for me. Do we have questions on either my end or Mike's end? Anything you want to talk about? Yeah, thank you both so much um, for sharing this content. Um, we don't have any questions from the group, but I will encourage those on the call. If you do have questions, feel free to use the chat or the QA box and I'd be happy to um, to share them out with the group on your behalf. Uh, I am curious though, wanted to ask both of you, since most of the people indicated in the first poll that we did, um, if they are using VR at their uh, organizations, currently most people indicated that they weren't. So I'm wondering what advice that you have, and you can build off some of the points you've already said, but what advice you have for those who are considering starting? You know, what, what things should they, uh, bring to their leadership in order to get this this moving at their organizations or how might they kind of make the case for paying for VR at their organization. So what advice might you have for those who are who are thinking about implementing this? Um, you want to take it? I'll start no, off. Okay. I, mean, I think I think you you're better. Yeah, okay. answering this. Yeah, I, first of all, you have to really make sure that there's a you know, you have a pain point that VR fits. Uh, again, you, and this has been said probably before, you, you don't want to just uh, just use VR for VR's sake. So you really got to find something where it works. Like in Melissa's case, it, as you can see, it's incredibly effective. And I think that it's going to become a major part of uh, chronic pain control. Um, and in the ER, when we used it, um, we actually used it for, um, you know, uh, distraction from painful procedures, but we're also starting to see that people like to use it and the nurses picked up on this. They would just start to use it for patients who were anxious um, and sort of especially younger people. Um, so you really don't just use it for uh, just because for VR sake, but you really got to find something that matches well. Um, the startups that are out there are sort of focused on specific areas like physical therapy, pain control, um, et cetera. There's also, you can use VR, and we didn't talk about this because we were patient-centered, but there's also a lot of applications for education, uh, both for patient-wise and also for um, staff-wise. Um, you know, w whether that's, uh, for example, like in-services and things on with complex uh, equipment, there, there are companies that are doing that. So you really just got to make sure you match it well, and you're just not using it because of the, of the wow factor. Uh, and then Again, like Melissa said, and we, we did, we make sure you demo multiple solutions and don't go with the first one because that's really important. Um, and understand your limitations. If you know you don't have a room, you don't have, or you can't use a computer, then you want to make sure that the app, uh, the applications or the solutions you're using fit sort of your resource limitations. Uh, again, it's it's you know if we had probably done this over again with Melissa because of like the, the room limitation, we probably would have picked more of like a, a standalone type of application or solution that essentially was all encompassed within the headset itself. It does all the tracking. You have the controllers there and it's all in one. You don't need a computer, um, but you have to look at your resources too. And then uh, that's why I, I put the metric slide up because uh, those are some of the things that people, I think uh, decision makers are gonna look at in terms of, okay, well, what are you gonna improve? So you should say, you know, here's the things that we 
think will help us, whether it's a, a return on investment financially, um, and if you can do the CPT codes, um, and like in Melissa's case or in physical therapy case, um, or if it's not financial, then is there a patient satisfaction uh, issue that you can help solve or something like that, but show them also where these metrics specifically that you're gonna use uh, with, with VR to improve. And then you can back that up with a lot of uh, literature that's out there now um, to show them, yes, that it's been shown at least you know, in, in research uh, environments that this works in them. So. Hey, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and we do actually have a few questions from the group. Um, so we'll get through the ones that we can. Um, I know you both talked about, uh, you know, trying to figure out which vendor is the best for your patients and for your organization. So what recommendations do you have for how people should go about that? Um, how do you, how have you approached finding the right vendor um, and what should people look out for or be prepared to ask? So, um, you want, Melissa, you want me to take that first and then you yeah, should. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the way we did it was we, um, you really have to do the research to see, you know, for, for your specific type of problem, what vendors are out there. Um, and you wouldn't want to limit yourself necessarily also to this country because actually one of the solutions we're using for uh, behavioral health um, is actually from outside of the country. Um, and so you really have to do your research to make sure you can get a list of vendors that are, uh, you know, are giving a solution for your problem. Um, and then you have to demo them. And um, this is more difficult now in, in, our, in our COVID type of world or new normal type of world, but you really, I, I don't think you should be able to, you should select a solution in this day and age, you, you have to test it. And whether that means them shipping you something and then they remotely demo it or they come and they use social distancing, but you really have to actually go through with it um, and, and see what, what, you know, how it feels to you. Um, and then envision how that's gonna be in your workflow. Yeah. Um, and then, then the other thing that I, I gave you a caveat about was I mentioned was the making sure that they understand the limitations in healthcare. Um, there's hygiene issues. You have to make sure that their solution is easily cleanable. And then you also have to make sure that if you are going to have some sort of remote connection to their servers, that um, all the HIPAA issues, you know, privacy and security issues have been and considered. I don't know if you want to add anything, Melissa. Yeah, no, I just uh, recall from when we were testing things out, um, you know, some of the companies had promised, like, in the future, this is going to happen. Um, you know, choose mine because it's we're going to get a biofeedback component in it. It'll, it should be in in the spring or something like that. So, yeah, just, um, you know, I, I, I would highly emphasize testing things out and going with what, what works now um, with companies. Yeah. And then another thing that I'm glad you brought that up that I would recommend doing is actually asking them to do a trial, a free yeah. trial to see how it works. Um, because that's important and you could really, you know, sort of test it out. And especially now when you, you may not be able to then ask for a free trial, like for a month. Um, and then you also need to look at, you know, if you're going to put a lot of effort and time into this, is this a uh, company somewhat stable? Have they been around a while? Uh, because some of the people I think that we talked to that we, we demoed with are no longer. Correct. I was just going to mention that, that companies do kind of uh, turn around quickly and, and, you know, the relationship with the company should feel professional and appropriate and, and one that you can call if there are issues and they have a good team, um, people, numbers to get a hold of and, you know, things like that. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you both so much. I'm um, just going to wrap us up as we're close to the one hour mark. And thank you for those who asked questions. Um, we didn't get to all of them, but I'll make sure to answer them for you uh, offline. Um,
So I'm just going to share a final closing poll. This will just uh, help us better understand um, how this content has supported your work and how CIN can further uh, support the work that you're doing at your organizations. Uh, we have a number of upcoming technical assistance offerings, which you can find on our website at www.chcf.org slash CIN, um, as well as the recording to the webinar um, that uh, Mike indicated from Dr. Kim Bullock that we had a few weeks back. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Melissa and Mike, for sharing the content. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.